it should be obvious that the wisdom of the world and the wisdom that comes from God are, are different. They're contrary to one another. Because the world talks about their way is wise. They would say that their way is the best way. That's what Satan has tried to do. That here, and he has deceived people, and they're thinking that his way is the best way. When, and it's sort of right back in the garden when, when Satan questioned, has God really said? Did he really say that? Oh, God is, God is lying to you. You will not die. He made it sound like God was keeping something back from them. Well, the, the only thing that God was keeping back from them was death and destruction and, and the suffering consequences of sin. And that's where the world's wisdom goes to. The world's wisdom is built on, on sand. It's a house on sand. That is illustrated in the parable that Jesus taught. We talked about the wise man built his house upon the rock. But the foolish man builds his house upon the sand. That they make it seem, the world makes it seem, that their way is wise, but it's nothing but a house built on sand. That when the storms of life come and all that comes, it's going to come crashing down upon them. That is the way of the world. And so if we want to be blessed by God, we need to go to God's word. We need to go... We got need to walk in God's ways. And so wisdom leads to a life that is holy, godliness, righteousness. A life that honors and seeks the Lord. Proverbs 19, 16. He who keeps the commandment keeps his soul, but he who is careless of conduct will die. That word for keep can also mean, can be translated guard. It can be read this way. He who guards the commandment guards his soul. The commandment that's described here is God's commandments, God's word. Even though it may be that here throughout that you hear that Solomon tells his son that, listen to my commandments, honor your mother's teachings, keep my ways, that, but all of it goes back to God's word. Because what he was trying to teach his son is what his father taught him. And that was God's ways. That's where his commandments were based upon. And so you keep God's word. And you're going to need to know God's word. That is how you can keep God's word. This means you need to read God's word. We, we cannot be left to our own imagination thinking we think we know what God's will is. Or I might or I, I'm not sure. Because that's where we can get ourselves in trouble. And so we have to go to God's word. We have to build a foundation upon Christ. We need to be reading God's word. We need to be daily reading. And not only reading, we need to be memorizing. Psalm 119.11, Your word I have a treasure in my heart. They may not sin against you. To treasure God's word laid up in my mind. To put it in a storehouse in my heart. In order to memorize God's word, we must delight in God's word. Psalm 1, 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. So we must ask ourselves, are we delighting in God's word? Are we delighting in God? Is our joy found in God? Is our joy found in his word? And one aspect of delighting in God's word would be to meditate upon it. That here, if I'm reading God's word, I'm memorizing it, I'm going to be thinking about that. I'm going to be thinking about it all over and over again. That here, how does this apply to my life? How does this apply to my walk with God? Here, how, can, how, what, how does this apply to the situation I'm going through? And so we're meditating upon God's word. 
It's one thing to know God's will, will and to know God's word by reading it, memorizing and meditating it, but it cannot stop there. We have to do God's will. Because there's a big difference between knowing something and actually doing it. That's all good to know something. We can know about what, the, what is the right way, but we have to do it. And so it's not enough to know God's ways are best. We have to live God's ways. We have to walk in his ways. That's why to keep the commandment, as this proverb tells you, implies that you are to obey God, live a godly, holy life that honors him. That's what wisdom is, is about, to live a life that glorifies him. Not to live according to my own wisdom, not to live a life that is according to the world's wisdom, but one that walks in God's ways, that sees that God's ways are best. 1 Peter 1, 14-16, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now it must be said that, and we must be reminded of this, our walk with God is not a performance. That here I try to earn God's favor, I, or trying to earn God's grace. I, I try to earn his blessings. No, we obey God because of what Christ has done, what he has done on the cross. Because God has forgiven you because of what Christ has done. When you place your faith in him, you're a new creature in Christ. You love God. Before you hated him. Before you hated his word. Before you hated those things. But you now love God. You now hate what is evil. You love what is good. You desire to do His will because you're a new, new creature in Christ. And the Holy Spirit's work in your life. See, we could do nothing to earn our salvation. There's nothing we can contribute to complete our salvation so that we can be forgiven. There's nothing we could ever do. We cannot, there's nothing we can do to contribute to Christ's work so that we are justified. But we actually are, that here the Holy Spirit works in us and through us, and we're dependent upon the Holy Spirit as we grow in the Christ likeness. This is our sanctification. That here it's not a, as I even said last week, it's not a live and let, live and let God type of thing thing where I just sit back and do nothing. That here that we are to know God's will, we're to do it. And we rely upon the Holy Spirit. We depend upon Him to grow us and to walk in God's ways. That here that that um, that just even Ephesians speaks of that that do not be drunk with wine for that is dissipation. But now I just now I just forgot my my, um, my point is is that we're to grow and we're to be dependent upon the Holy Spirit. I'm actually going to go to I know where that verse is at, and I apologize there. That. Um, Now I remember, we're to be filled with the Spirit, is what that Ephesians speaks of. We're not to be drunk with wine for this dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And to be filled up with the Spirit is that we're dependent upon Him, relied upon Him, obeying. That here, that, that God is in control of our lives. Look at verse 16 again. Proverbs 19:16. He who keeps the commandment keeps his soul, but he who is careless of conduct will die. What does it mean to keep your soul? Well, Proverbs 16, 17 says, The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He who watches his way preserves his life. 
preserve your life. To keep your life. Matthew Henry says this, If we keep God's word, God's word will keep us from everything really hurtful. God's ways are always best. That's what, that's what is to keep your soul, to keep your life. When you obey God, you're not going to experience the consequences of your sin. And notice I emphasize your sin. Because we're still going to suffer, we're going to still experience the consequences of other people's choices that affect us. But we're not going to be affected by consequences because there is not going to be consequences because we're obeying God. We're not sinning. But when we do sin, there is consequences. And that's what God's Word keeps us from, is the heartache, the suffering, and the sorrow. And then when God saves you, you're kept from the eternal consequences of your sin because of Christ. John three thirty six. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Here, that we obeyed the Lord repented and believed because that is a commandment <laughs> that he who believes in the son has eternal life but he who does not obey the son will not see life those who do not repent those who do not trust Christ and so we keep our souls look at Proverbs 19:16 again he who keeps the commandment keeps his soul but he who is careless of conduct will die the one who is careless that is the unbeliever, the person who does not delight in God's word, does not care what God says, does not want to know what God's will is, does not want to meditate upon God's word. They don't care. And that person will experience the consequences of their sin. They will not experience God's blessings on their life, but experience his wrath. Because that is what their way is headed. The consequences. The way of the transgressor is hard that we saw that in a previous proverb they're on the broad road as Jesus described the broad road which leads to hell because there's a narrow gate a narrow way a broad road and a broad gate Matthew 7 13 through 14 enter through the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction and there are many who enter it for the gate is small and the narrow is way that leads to life and there are few who find it and so the one who's careless, the one that ignores God, ignores his warnings, and listens to what the world and Satan says that, oh, here's where you can find wisdom. But that way leads to death. That's what Proverbs has been illustrating over and over again. The strange woman, her road leads to, her way leads to death. The murder, the lying, the theft, that leads to destruction. The hell. The way the lazy, the sluggard. And so consider what road are you on? Because there's only two. One leads to hell and one leads to life through Jesus Christ. And if you find yourself on the broad road, repent today. Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. And then also, secondly, a life that has God's blessings is one who is generous. Wisdom leads to generosity. And that's because of the new birth. That here a wife that's living a life that's living by faith. One that's changed by the Holy Spirit. Proverbs 19:17, one who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his good deed. How often have we heard in the book of Proverbs, to be generous, to be gracious, over and over again. Because, And why do we hear that? Why do we hear that repeated throughout the New Testament? To be gracious and kind, to give to those who are in need. That's because we often need to be reminded that we need to be gracious, to be generous, because everything we have belongs to the Lord. He is the one who has given it to us as well. And this verse reminds us to be compassionate as well. That's what part of generosity is. Because a person can be generous and not compassionate. 
I should say in a way that they could just give without truly being compassionate, but we need to be compassionate and loving. God is our example in that because He's a compassionate and gracious God. He cares about the poor. He's the defender of the orphan and the widow. A defender of the rights of the poor as well. He's one who established in, in Israel that they were, when they came into the land, and when they were to gather the wheat and the barley and even the grapes, that they were not to glean, that is to harvest, the corners of their fields. And if they dropped stuff, that, that was to stay there because of that would be for the poor. That God had provided for the poor. That they could go and work. They can go down there, go harvest the corners of these fields, things that were left on the ground, if it was still edible and good, that was still, they could have that. Ruth benefited from, from that. And even Boaz went beyond what God had said and had them purposely throw down the crops. That here that they were to put extra down just for her. And so God cared about, about them. He, there's many things that God speaks of that they weren't to take their cloak as a pledge when they when they given a loan. They were not to loan at interest. They were just to give to the poor. And we should have a love in our hearts for those who are in need. Never should we despise those who are poor and who fell in hard times because not everyone who is poor is, is lazy. Yeah, there are poor people who are lazy and like the sluggard. And the Bible says the man that shall not work shall not eat. And so he, his word describes that. But there are those who are poor because of circumstances beyond control. The, anyone's control. And that has been even made even clearer these last two years beyond, because of people are losing their jobs. They can't, and inflation is a big thing where you can't, it's hard now to pay your bills and to have food where things cost so much more. And so what, what has happened is these things are beyond our control. Beyond many control, people's control. And there's a reason why I said we should have a love for people in need, because you can give but not have love. And that would mean it didn't profit us anything. 1 Corinthians 13, 3, And if I give all my possessions to be feed the poor, and if I surrender my body be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Paul says if we were to give everything to feed the poor, but yet not have love, that's useless. Because there's people who give for different reasons. Some might be because they're compelled. That, oh, uh, Okay. Others might be because they want to show off. That look at me. That here I am. They, they, be the, they might as well have a parade coming to their giving. That's often what I think about when I see these huge checks from businesses. When just give in secret. So sometimes it might be appropriate to let people know what they hear when you have a fund rate. You know, when they were trying to raise all this money, and then you let people know what we got, what we were able to get. But sometimes people just, they just bring these large checks out of show. But see, we're to have a true love for people. We're to have a love for God at the same time. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven through 40. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. This is where God's people and the world are different. God's people genuinely love God and people at the same time. It's not, I choose to love God today, I love people tomorrow. 
It's we love both. That fulfills the law. That's what all the commandments are, ba- are built on. Is and it really a love for people even goes back to a, a genuine love for the Lord. If we love God with our whole heart, with our soul, and with our mind, then we're going to love people as well. And this is where God's people in the world differentiate. Because there are those who can claim to love God, but they hate people. And that's what we would say that they're a false believer. I should say most likely a false believer. And if they are a believer, they need to repent and turn from that wickedness. 1 John 4.20 If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. That's why I said that they're most likely a false believer. They're lying. They hear the love of God is not in them. That's why they cannot love people as well. And in God's kindness, there are those who run saved who do show kindness to the poor by helping them. But they don't love God. But God's people, as I said, are different. We love God and we love people. We want to help those in need. But we also want to care for their soul as well. Not only provide for physical needs, but spiritual needs as well. Because it's worthless to help the poor or someone in need and not give them the gospel at the same time because that's an opportunity to share the gospel. And second, we must give to help their needs, but according to our abilities. Because there are times when, you know, that here that I have people call up and we're unable to help them. And I, my heart goes out to them, but we don't have the money to be able to, to cover. For, I'm talking about, it's not, I'm not talking about food. I'm talking about they, it's rent or a new vehicle, or, or helping for a vehicle. That we don't have that ability. I wish we, wish we could help people like that, but we give to according to our abilities. James 2, 15 through 16. If a brother or sister was out clo- without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? And then First, P- first John three seventeen. But whoever has the world goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? So we can, have, we can love people and have compassion for them and a want to be ge- generous, but we can only be generous with what we have, not what we wish we had. Look at verse 17 again. One who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his good deed. The Bible says that when you're generous to those in need, you are actually lending to the Lord. It's not as if God needs it. But the Lord says He repay you for your good deed. Those who who you give to are often not able to repay, repay you back, and neither should you expect that. I've had people where I've helped and they've wanted my number or address to be able to repay me. And they, and not that as I asked them, but they're the ones that volunteered that, but they didn't. Not that I was expecting that, but yet they went back on their word. They would promise to say, oh, I'm going to. But you know what? When God says he'll repay, he actually means that. He's not just trying to say, something that makes us feel good or trick us into be generous, but that here God will, God will repay back. And that may be in different ways. It doesn't mean that God's going to always give you money. He may give in other ways that you may need, a physical need. It may be a spiritual blessing. And it's definitely eternal blessings. Because we're laying up treasure in heaven. That's where our heart is to be. You know, I think of the story that f- about this pastor that it that here that um, he was a pastor in in the new one of the New England states, and a poor man asked his pastor for money. 
The pastor asked his wife if they had anything to give the man. This is all we have, said the wife to her husband. Forty-eight cents. Have faith in God, answered the pastor. He could give us $48 in place of those 48 cents. The pastor was a cheerful giver, so let's see what came of it. About an hour later, a wealthy friend of the pastor who lived some distance away came to see him along with his servant. They had come to town on business. He stopped at the pastor's home to get something to eat while they visited. But this gentleman noticed while he was eating lunch with them how sad and downcast the pastor and his wife seemed. He asked what was wrong, but the lady avoided giving an answer and soon left the room. Then the gentleman asked his friend if they were in need of money, but the pastor only smiled and said nothing. As soon as the gentleman was alone with the servant, he asked him if he had any money with him and how much. They both looked into the wall to see what they had with them. The gentleman discovered he had $45 and his servant had only three. He wished very much that he could give find two more dollars in his pockets so that he could give the pastor the round sum of $50. But that is all they had with them. Well, the gentleman took the $48 and gave them to the pastor, saying, I am sure, my friend, that you are short of money. I would like to give you $50, but that is all we have. The pastor was overcome with surprise and joy. He counted out the money on the table and called in his wife. Look and see how soon God has acted. He didn't even wait till the day was passed, but through our kind friend here sent us $48 for the 48 cents we gave to that poor man this morning. And then they told their friend all about it, and he was delighted to find that he had neither more nor less than what was sufficient to repay the good pastor a hundredfold for what he had so cheerfully given to the poor man that morning. They thanked and praised God with humble, joyful hearts. Now, it doesn't always mean God is going to repay a hundredfold. God can. I've had at times where I've given my last few dollars to someone, and the Lord very soon had repaid much more. And it was actually is what I needed for something that, came, that had happened. That whether it was like a car repair or new ti- I needed tires, the Lord would... He had helped me. I think of a, a story I heard about, I believe it was Charles Spurgeon, that the Lord laid on his heart to give to M- George Mueller. That if most of you, I think, are familiar with George Mueller, that here that often he was dependent on people giving money. And so Spurgeon sent some money there, and very soon the Lord actually replaced that money because they needed it, as, needed it as well for their ministry. The Lord, uh, Lord owns everything. And see, God, He's able to, this, this is, He tells this, us this to spur us to generosity and compassion and love for one another. And what, when you help those in need, it's like you're doing that to the Lord. Matthew 25, 35 to 40. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent you did to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. And so we should remember that. Oh, that... Not only should we be generous, but we should have implied in there is a love and a compassion along with generosity. And remembering that the Lord has given us, that he owns that to begin with, and the Lord will take care of us. That he will help us. And so we've got to remember that. This is what true wisdom is, that 
The world doesn't look, like it, look at that like that. The world laughs at God's ways. The world mocks God and his ways. But they're the ones that are in danger. They're the ones that need to hear Christ. They're the ones that hear that verse 16 that we talked about. They're, 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 they're careless and their way leads to death. And they need to hear about Christ to repent and believe. Lord Jesus Christ. That here I know that it's dark times. I know that here we every day it seems like there's another shooting. Another murder. Another robbery. These th- all these things that are happening. And wars and new diseases and that. And at times things look bleak. But we have to remember who's on their throne. That who's the one that's reigning and ruling? That who is in charge? It's God. And so God can work in people's hearts. That here the light shines brightest. The gospel light will shine the brightest in the darkest of times. That here I'm reminded of throughout history, even in the darkest times there have been Great revivals. In the days of the Reformation, they were in darkness under Roman Catholicism and all these other stuff going on. Think of the, in the England, there were times that here that, that we always think of, and let me back for a moment, we always think of the old days that were here that people, they were just, they were good, even I'd say people, good and kind and didn't do wickedness, but that's not true. Even in the days of the Puritans, that there was evil going on. That things that here one one book that illustrates that is by John Bunyan. That here that the, uh, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, they wrote the life of Mister Badman, and there's things in there that he talks about that don't seem like they're an illustration, but that they are, I, I just say, a made-up story is what I mean, but very true. Of here, the life of Mr. Badman, that here, that we think abortion is bad. They, he tells stories about people who would kill their babies after, after death, after birth, I mean. I won't go into what they would do, but a great, I don't want to go back to those days that but yet there's people who are advocating that, the right to kill a baby even after it's born. But even during these dark times, spiritually dark, we need to let our gospel light shine. We need to tell others about the gospel. I believe there could be a revival. I pray for revival. I hope you pray for revival. I hope you pray for opportunities for your neighbors and friends and people to be able to and strangers that to share the gospel with them and point them to Christ. Because we want to let our light shine. We don't want to just keep the gospel to ourselves. We're to go and make disciples.